The classic example would be the Barsoom series, which is by Edgar Rice Burroughs. It's also the name of the guy who invented Tarzan, and one of the very few famous Edgars. What? <laughs> we ha- we've had this discussion before. There's not very many Edgars. It's it's, it's an unusual name. Uh, yeah, no, that's very that's very true. <laughs> Sorry, do you want me to do that again? No, that's brilliant, man. Sorry, I just, <laughs> I just need to recover slightly. <laughs> oh, oh, God. Okay, all right. <laughs> so, sorry. <continue>. <laughs> okay, so Edgar, I am not a very famous Edgar. That's okay. I could deal with that. Uh, <laughs> I, I made no statement in favor or against that that idea, <laughs> I'm possibly the best of Edgar's, but that's kind of I'm I, I'm biased. <laughs> so we had a couple of interesting comments on the Reddit, and the first one was from a redditor called Acid Pants Two Two Zero, which is a, a great username, and it was a comment about kind of clarifying our mocking of Star Trek in the previous uh, episode. Okay. Uh, it was saying that, remember, we were mocking the whole, like, holographic projector thing. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. And basically, it was just telling us, reminding us that um, holographic technology in the Star Trek universe is is an emergent thing at the time of Voyager. And that that is, that is why we don't have, like, AI ships, you know, exploring the universe. Which is a very valid point, because, I mean, like, you know the way the Doctor gets his hollow emitter? Yeah. Which is, I think, a piece of 27th century technology. Oh, yeah, from exactly. The future. Yeah, it's from 20... the future's future. It's from the future, future, exactly. Um, so you know that kind of indicates that hollow technology has really, really moved on in that time. Okay. So it's an emergent thing. So I thought that was a really astute comment from Acid Pants. That was really cool. So maybe by the the 27th century or whatever, there'll be more humanitarian. According to the criticisms we laid out last last time. Well, I'd like to say you laid out, but yes. That I laid out. Well, you, you started off by saying we, Edgar. You started off by saying we were mocking when I was merely pointing out. <laughs> That's a fair point. That's a fair point. But yeah. And so anything on that, Bill? Um, Another thing that we mentioned before, which is... Uh, I'll just pick up from there about Star Trek. I think in one of the very first episodes, I was talking about issues of scale in world building. Right. And how, in a lot of ways, you could just as easily set Star Trek or Star Wars or a lot of other space-based fiction in an ocean instead. So that instead of it being the Brave Rebels fighting against the the evil Galactic Empire, it's Brave Rebels fighting against a naval colonial empire. Yeah. Or it's an explorer called Captain Kirk instead of a space explorer called Captain Kirk. Exactly, yeah. And I have seen recently in a few places that Star Trek was actually initially inspired very much by a naval series. Oh, no way. Yeah. It's um, the Hornblower series, it's called, by C.S. Forrester. Oh, cool. Uh, written around when? It was written in the st- at the start, or the, the kind of early to mid 20th century, I think. Okay. So from, from the 30s up to the 50s, something like that. Huh. And it's about the adventures of a guy called Horatio Hornblower, who's in the British Navy around the Napoleonic Wars. And it charts his career from, I think, from midshipman right up to admiral. A couple of things here. First yeah. of all, Horatio Hornblower is, is a brilliant name. It's fantastic, isn't it? It's a wonderful <laughs> name. And, and secondly, what is a midshipman? A midshipman is, it's like the lowest officer ranking. So it's it's below lieutenant. And at the time well-born, like, middle-class and upper-class boys who wanted to join the Navy would probably have joined as midshipmen uh, when they were about 13 or 14. Okay, and Admiral is, like, the top of the thing. There's various degrees of Admiral, yeah, but, like, Admiral is is the, the peak, pretty much. The, oh, okay. There's, like, three, three degrees of it. I mean, you could be promoted to then being, like, the head of the Admiralty or to be, like, a lord or something, but, yeah, they're, they're high up. They're at the top of the, the naval hierarchy. Oh, cool. Very cool. Will you throw me a link to this book and I'll put it in the show notes? Yeah, sure thing. Have but, you uh, have you read it? I, I haven't read it, no. I came across it because I've mentioned before that I'm reading the Aubrey Maturin series, the Master and Commander books. Yeah. And uh, I think that this was a bit of an influence on them. They were written slightly earlier. Okay. 
they've been influenced on a lot of other things. The the Sharp series is kind of meant to be Hornblower, but set on land. Do you know Sharp? I don't. What's this? It's a series of books by Bernard Cornwell. Okay. And it follows a, a, a guy in the British Army during the kind of Napoleonic era as well. So it start, starts off in like the late 1700s in India and then it follows all like the campaigns in Europe afterwards. And it, it, it's the same thing. It charts his rise through through the ranks. And it was a TV show or a series of TV shows with uh, Sean Bean playing the main character. Cool. Yeah. They're pretty good. Very cool. And yeah, so it was it was an influence on Gene Roddenberry when he wanted to create the setting. And I think some of the directors of various uh, Star Trek series and films have said that they used Hornblower as an inspiration for Kirk and Picard. That's brilliant. Yeah. That's really cool. So it's definitely, once once I've uh, gotten through the next 17 books of the Aubrey Maturin series, I might have a look at uh, Hornblower as well. <laughs> <laughs> The next 17 books. I, yeah. I, once I've gotten through the next couple of hundred Star Trek episodes, I may decide to turn off my telly and perhaps read that book. Oh, well, you could watch the Hornblower TV show. I feel like I'd like to read the book. <laughs> I feel like I'm on sensory overload right now with the amount of TV I watch. That's um, fair enough. I think I need to like turn it off and read a book. But yeah, so there you go. The Hornblower series by, who was it again? Uh, C.S. Forrester. C.S. Forrester. We'll throw it in the show notes and people can go check it out. Um, we had another comment uh, on the Reddit. Oh, yeah? From Kyle Parrish 47 Okay. Who I'm just going to refer to as Kyle from now on. It's, it's kind of easier. Uh, he talked about the programs I use, or, or, or rather the software I use when I create my videos. Okay. And he had a question about how I do the audio. And I think I wasn't very clear in in the last episode. Uh, And I think uh, the impression was that I do audio within Final Cut Pro. Right. Or at least that's what Kyle picked up on. Uh, And that's not the case. I just want to make this clear because uh, Final Cut Pro is probably the worst place one could do audio. Uh, (laughs) So I do my audio, Kyle, in Audition. That's my DAW of choice. And just as a full list kind of as a full disclosure sort of thing, I do my editing of the video in Final Cut Pro, my audio editing in Audition, and any sort of like like animation or effects I need to do, I do that within uh, Adobe After Effects. So it's a pretty pretty demanding um, skill set to, to use all of those three. I don't think so. I think Final Cut no? and Audition are quite, like, they're quite accessible. Uh, After Effects isn't. Okay. At all, and I'm I'm nowhere near proficient with After Effects. Like I still need to run an awful lot of tutorials while working with it, and it takes me a long time. It like it, in the last video, um, the video was the Peanut by Eric Lang. It was a short story video. Mm-hmm. I have a scene where uh, the Peanut, the main character, our protagonist of the story, uh, is flying through the air. Yeah, and clouds are zipping by in the background. Now, for anyone who knows how to do After Effects, that's probably a really easy effect to do and would take them, you know, tops five minutes. I think that took me a good day. That was a full day of work. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've, yet to, uh, I've yet to become proficient with After Effects. But yeah, so that's just to answer Kyle's question there. And also Kyle is a sound engineer, I believe he said, or works with sound. And he was quite complimentary of the sound we're getting. So I was really happy with that because oh, cheers, Carl. It's it's really good, really really cool. Yeah, thank you. Because um, a podcast without good sound would kind of be a bit of a waste of time. For sure. <laughs> For anyone who's who's interested, I record uh, into Reaper, which is a very good DAW, which you can download, and I think there's like a sixty day trial, and then it's only, I think a forty quid, like a forty euro license. It's very very affordable and very easy to use. Oh, I thought Reaper was open sourced. No, you ha- you have to pay- buy a license, but they don't enforce that. So it's it's easy enough for people to to not pay, pay it, but right, you should because it's a really good program, yeah. and you need people to pay it to pay, to pay for it to keep developing the program. And apparently, they're really nice blokes. So cool, that's really good. I I used Reaper a little bit in in college to do some audio work, and mm-hmm. it was a good program. It was again really accessible. Um, yeah, which is kind of what you want when you want to. And they've game. they've just released Reaper Five, and this is the the first episode that we're recording on Reaper Five. Ooh, very mm-hmm. cool! One of my favorite things about Audition, just as a little point, 
the like the selling point for it over other DAWs like Reaper or Logic and things like that, um, is that it's got an amazing noise eradication program in it. Oh, really? Yeah. So when you have like, if you have like a background hiss, uh, which is often the case in the podcast, actually, there's a little hiss running through the entire podcast. Um, mm-hmm. It's like, you know, you got to learn two shortcuts and just do those two shortcuts, hit enter or hit return two times and then noise gone. Brilliant. Which is awesome. And you can also, it's really cool as well. You can also open up the waveform and like Photoshop style, go in and paint out frequencies. Oh, that's great. Yeah, well, I'm doing that. That is like, that is just, it blows my mind. I can't believe humans are able to invent stuff that do like that does that. It's great. Uh, but yeah, so thanks Kyle and Acid Pants uh, for your comments. They're really cool. And just, I've got one quick bit of follow-up. Oh, go um, for it. From Dominic, who we mentioned in a previous episode that he had come up with a system for mapping galaxies. Yes, Dominic, the galactic cartographer. Yes. So uh, we talked a little bit about that and he just dropped us a note to say that we could use the the formula he gave us to, we could put that in the show notes for anyone who's interested. And uh, he, he just points out that one of the main principles behind that system was to give each volume a unique name and one that could be identified immediately by its distance from the center. And that makes it easier to calculate uh, traveling distances and things. Mm, exactly. So that was his kind of intent with developing that system. And he acknowledges that the geographical and political, or astrographical, I suppose, and <laughs> political side of things aren't as well covered by that. But, you know, that's that's fine. Yeah, that's, and I think... That's a, you know, no one map projection for, like, a, a planet covers every kind of eventuality, so... Exactly, and I think it's also the mark of a good world builder when you can realise the flaws in your design, mm-hmm. but are able to, like, brush over them for the greater good, if you know what I mean. I, I wouldn't even see it as brushing over them. It would just be, like, acknowledging that it's not what that is for. It's intended to do a different thing, and that's okay. Like, you know, like, Mercator isn't meant to show the correct size of things. It's That's not what the pr- point of that projection is. Exactly, yeah. I, I think, yeah. rather, it would be a case that you realize that a good world world builder realizes that world building will never produce a perfect result. Yeah, nothing you, is going to satisfy every parameter. Exactly, and you just need to be okay with that. And mm-hmm. I think that's the mark for a good world builder where they can be they can be all right with those things. So before we move on to our main topic today, Bill, I just want to ask you a question. Yeah. Constellations. Right? Right. Yeah. I hear that you don't get them. It's true. You d- and I want to elaborate for the listener on why you what what does what does don't get mean? I I don't see constellations when I look at the sky. I don't see the patterns. Now, dear listener, Bill told this to me on my personal social media during was it a week or two ago, and this yeah. blew my mind. The concept of someone not being able to see constellations is just it's just beyond me. So I'd like to quiz you a little bit on this. Why do you think, Bill, you can't see these constellations? Okay, I can see Orion's belt, because it's three stars in a very straight line, very close together. Right, okay. But otherwise, I I don't recognise any patterns there. Like, people... Like, I, I, I see Orion's belt, but I don't see the rest of Orion. I don't see a dude, a hunter dude or anything. Okay. I And, and when I look at them, I just see points of light, and I, I don't see them connecting at all. And th- even if someone, like, were to draw the thing that is meant to be up there for you. I mean, I've seen illustrations of the constellations and what they're meant to be, but I don't, I don't see that in the, in the night sky. And, and like this, this counts for even like the super bright ones, like the Big Dipper. Never seen it. You've never seen the Big Dipper? Nope. Oh man, that's, that's really, that's really amazing. Has, has anyone ever tried to show you the constellations? Not in person, no. Okay, I think I might make this a mission of mine. Okay. To have you find the constellations. Like, I, like I'll like i perfectly admit, right, that some of them are, like, they're a bit tenuous. You're kind of like, yeah, but it's not really a fish, though. You know? And some of them are, like, like the Big Dipper, like, it smacks of looking like a spoon or a plow if you're in England. But, but yeah, by and large, though, they kind of, once you know where they are, they kind of do pop out at you. It's a plow in Ireland as well, man. Is it also a plow here? I've always referred to it as a big spoon. Like a, like a ladle. 
I'm pretty sure that the what's the other name for for the Big Dipper? Uh, the Big Bear or thing? What is it? Some bear? Ursa Major, isn't it? Hmm. Anyway, it, it's it's on like the the flag of an Irish labour movement from the early 20th century, I think. Is it? Yeah. Huh. The a link between Irish labour movements and Alaska. Uh, it's on the Alaskan flag. Yeah, as far as I know, you want to give it a quick Google there. Yeah, I'm going to give this a Google. Um. Oh, you're right. It is on the Alaskan state flag. Yeah. Uh, which, 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 by the way, is a very good flag. That's all right. I, I, I really like the Alaskan flag. Props, Alaska. Yeah. The Starry Plow flag was originally used by the Irish Citizen Army, which was James Con- James Connolly's movement. Really? Yeah. Uh huh. Honestly, growing up, no one ever referred to it as the Plow Army. It was always the Big Dipper. Interesting. And isn't isn't that like a play? The 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 Plow and the Stars. Is that an Irish play? That's an Irish play. Yeah. I think oh. it's by the same guy who did, like, Juno and the Peacock and, and all that stuff. Huh. There you go. Like, no, The Plough yeah. and the Star is a, is a play, and I can see now that it probably is called The Plough, but, um, yeah, no, I've never referred to that uh, when I was younger. But in any case, Bill. Yep. You know what we're going to do when I bring you uh, Star Finding? What are we going to do? We're going to do a couple of pro tips, right? I'm going to give these to the listeners just in case anyone else in a similar predicament to Bill. Um, okay, I'm going to take these down. Do get out a pen and paper. Do your, do your <laughs> rustling thing. I always have a pen and paper. Right? <laughs> so, tip number one when trying to see stars is that it is totally futile to just walk out at night, look up, and try and identify patterns in the sky. Your eyes need quite a bit of time to adjust to the light. Um, and you need to stand there for like a good 10, 15 minutes before you're going to be able to pick out the fainter ones. So, pro tip number one, Wait. Be patient, okay. Be patient. And it is amazing the difference, though. It goes from being a not-so-starry night to being a really starry night once your eyes have adjusted. So that's the uh, first tip. Second tip is it's also futile to stand there with a friend and just point at the sky randomly with your meat digits. That doesn't help anyone because, you know, they're not connected to your face. They don't have the same perspective as you. So the best thing to do would be to draw pictures. Okay. That's tip number two. Tip number three is, this is a really uh, cool tip. If you hold your thumb and pinky as far away from each other as possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That held at arm's length, the distance between your thumb and your pinky is about 25 degrees in the sky. So you can start saying, like, if someone finds the constellation X, you can then go like, oh, just go south 25 degrees. And then really easily you can start work making your way around the sky. Huh. Okay. So uh, that's what we shall do, Bill. Cool. And you know what we're going to do? We're going to start with the constellation Cassiopeia. Why Cassiopeia? Because it's it's kind of my kind of like a home constellation. I find that and then I can find my way around everything else. So we're going to find Cassiopeia, which looks like kind of a W in the sky. And then we're going to move along the Milky Way, Bill. Mm-hmm. And for those for those of you in urban areas, yes, we will be able to see the Milky Way here in rural Ireland. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the Milky Way. Yeah. Obviously, I can see the Milky Way. Uh, mm, do I make this point? No, I won't make that point because it's going to turn into a big, long digression. Okay. So we're going to move along the Milky Way. And then we're going to get to a constellation called Cygnus. Uh, and then from there, we're going to find our way to my favorite constellation of all time, Bill. What's that? Lyra. What's Lyra? Lyra is, yeah, so it's not one of the famous constellations at all. In fact, it's actually a pretty boring shape. It's just kind of like a like a parallelogram with an extra star above it. So it's really boring, right? But the okay. thing that makes it really interesting is that it contains the God's Eye Nebula. Okay. Are you Googling it? I'm Googling Lyra. <laughs> Google the God's Eye Nebula as well, because it's a really famous nebula. Okie doke. So the God's Eye Nebula is cool in and of itself, but the really interesting part, Bill, is Mm -hmm. a thing called the Double Double. Okay. And the Double Double is a four-star system located near the constellation Lyra that has two pairs in it. So a double binary system. A double binary system, hence the name Double Double. Okay. And so every time I look at the night sky, Bill, and I look in that direction, part of me likes to think, that I'm looking at 12 colonies of cobalt <laughs> from Battlestar Galactica. And I, and I want to show you how to find it. I really do. Fair enough. 
So we're go- we'll make that a date. You can hand me some Salmiak. I can show you some constellations. It'll be brilliant. Perhaps a Christmas present may even be exchanged. Who knows? Salmiak and, and your, your severely overdue Christmas present at this stage. At this stage, it may even be next Christmas. Like this Christmas coming. <laughs> Look, it's not my fault. <laughs> no, no, it's totally my fault. Totally my fault. Uh, I don't think it's anyone's fault. We just We just live very far away. But Bill, as well, right? On the subject okay. of double planetary systems, or even just planetary systems, I think that's a nice segue into our main topic. I think it is. So today, we're going to talk about planetary systems. Excellent. So we're going to talk about planetary systems today. So, and instead of, you know, listing off various planetary systems in fiction, which is, you know, let's face it, really dull, we thought the best thing to do would be to build our own planetary systems and discuss... You know, why we built them, uh, what was our motivations, and, you know, give you an insight into planetary system that way. Good idea, Bill? Sounds like a great idea. Good, very good. So I set Bill the homework of making a planetary system, and I too also made a planetary system. We used the the, the information in the artifact scene videos to build our planetary systems, so maybe it's a, this is a good place to pause and check out those videos. I'll link them in the show notes um, so you know how we're deriving all of our info. Definitely. Cool, very good. So, Bill, tell us a little bit about your planetary system. Okay, well, I suppose the the main thing to start off with would be the star. That sounds like a very good place to start, yes. (laughs) Tell us about your star. One star, Um, multiple stars? So I built a single star system. Okay, very good. And it's... the, The system overall is quite like the solar system that we are currently in, for a number of reasons, which I'll, which I'll get into. The star is slightly bigger than our own sun. It's 5% bigger. Okay, so it's very sun-like. It's very sun-like. Okay. And what were the motivations for keeping it sun-like? Because you could have built any type of star. I could have built any kind of star, but for me, most of what I, I do is based around storytelling and the kind of stories it will allow me to tell and the kind of settings that will derive from the 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 physical parameters that I've created. Okay. And I had the idea that I wanted to make a setting that was a little bit planetary romance themed. Now, for people who don't know, planetary romance is a type of fantasy from, say, late 19th, mostly the early 20th century. The main example is the Barsoom series by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Cool. It's uh, That's set on Mars. John Carter of Mars is the is the first novel. And oh, it's about yeah. You've heard of these? Yeah, they, they made the movie out of it, didn't they? They made a movie a couple of years ago, yeah, which yeah. I, I I don't think did particularly well. No, it's meant I to be very bad. I haven't seen it myself. But they, they're kind of a, a classic series, and it's John Carter is a Confederate soldier who astral projects to Mars and meets all sorts of aliens and princesses in need of rescuing and, and all these kind of things. Brilliant. <laughs> and there's a lot of other stuff, like, you know, Venus is, is a different planet as well in that, I think. But I thought this this was kind of an interesting type of setting that I'd like to explore and do a little bit with. So a lot of what I've got here is quite similar to our own solar system, as I said, but different in specific ways and a lot of the time for specific reasons. Cool. Very cool. My main thing is that I wanted to try get two planets into the habitable zone because, you know, I could just hand wave it because it is sort of a fantastic setting Mm. but because i am going to be playing around with certain more implausible things i wanted to get this sort of stuff more rigorous and more accurate cool i'm a a big fan of the rigor big fan of the rigor cool very good so single star system sun like star yeah yes and oh for the listeners as well we're going to throw the data from the systems that we created in the show notes so you can kind of read along as we talk about this so i go into the show notes and check it out so do you want to hear my stars Please. I did not opt for a single star. Okay. I opted to go over the top and build three stars. Right. Because I am nothing if not ambitious. <laughs> and what it is, is I have a close binary pair, like Tatooine, with a very distant companion. Okay. Okay. And my stars are all smaller than the sun. They're, the main star is three quarters the mass of the sun. And its companion is half the mass of the sun. That's the Tatooine binary pair. Okay. And then the very distant star is only one-tenth the mass of the sun. So it's a, it's barely a star. Okay. So my, my motivations behind that uh, were that I wanted to kind of hint at my favorite systems from fiction. So I wanted to hint at, obviously, Tatooine, 
with the double binary with, with the with the binary. And I wanted to also hint at Battlestar Galactica, the twelve colonies of Cobalt, because that's a four star system. And I didn't want to, you know, directly copy Battlestar, so I thought three stars would be a good good kind of like a good in between. Okay, cool. Yeah. And also I wanted to keep everything kind of of the same mass in the same ballpark because it like hints that these stars were formed in the same place. Because sometimes it's a little bit implausible if you have like, I don't know, like a star of like 50 solar masses accompanied by a star of, you know, one tenth the, sol- uh, the mass of, of Sol. Oh, I get you. Okay. Yeah, so they're all that formed. That doesn't tend to happen then. It, it, can, it can happen, yes. But I wanted to hint at the fact that these guys formed from the same like kind of molecular cloud. Yeah. Um, my distant companion is is different. Like I said, it's barely a star. It's very, very small. And I think that's because I'd like it to be like a trapped star. So the idea is that it is inherently different from the binary pair. Uh, and it was formed in some other cloud far, far away and was ejected and was caught by my binary pair. All right. Yeah. So that was that was my my kind of thinking, and like stat nerds, I think would be able to logic that out. Most people won't won't care. They just see three stars and go, "Oh, cool, that's three stars." But I had a little bit a, a deeper level of thinking there, you know. Now I've I've got kind of a a sort of question about the orbits here. Oh, go for it. Could you have then the distant companion orbiting at kind of a a, a crazy angle, like a, away from the sort of the plane of the planetary orbits, because it it wouldn't have formed in the same disk. Oh, that's very. Va- that's a good point. I had not thought of that. I would. I would imagine yes, and I'd imagine having a crazy orbit would hint further at the sort of trapped nature of that star. That's and, something I need to worry about, man. That's really good. Thank you. And then talking about the, uh, you know, one of your videos is about the perception of the heavens and and what you know what it would look like to to people on on the surface of the planets. Mm-hmm. That would probably presumably be pretty visible if it's you know a, a, a distant a distant companion, but it's a star and it's going at a crazy angle. Then that's going to be really striking in the sky. Exactly. Yeah, I think worst case scenario. I haven't done the math behind this, but worst case scenario, it would look like an extremely bright star. Cool. Um. So it definitely would have some sort of cultural significance. Uh, and that was again that was part of my thinking. So yeah. So there there we go. So we have Bill system. Uh, with one star, one sun-like star, an Edgar system with three stars all below the mass of the sun and one kind of weird trapped one. Yeah. Nice. Cool, I like. Oh, and by the way, just so we don't have to keep referring to it as Bill system and Edgar system, uh, what are we calling these systems? What's the name of your system? Uh, for the moment, the working title is Handwavia. Brilliant. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm terrible with names. Uh, I'm going with Dagger at the moment. Okay. That's Dagger with a single G. Purely because it's an anagram of Edgar. <laughs> <laughs> like it was like I was I was building this system like at like at like eleven eleven o'clock midnight last night, and I I was not in the humor to try and come up with some sort of naming thing. So we have Handwavia and the Dagger system. Okay, so those are our stars. Uh, so I I think probably the next most important thing about a planetary system is habitable worlds. Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, like, once you've got your stars, that's the next step. So, tell us about your habitable worlds, Bill. Okay, well, one of my goals in making the system was to have it quite densely populated to give me as many opportunities for different kinds of planets and different locales within the setting uh, okay. as possible. Right. So, I have six terrestrial planets, six rocky planets in the inner system. Oh, not all in the habitable zone, no. Not all in the habitable oh, zone, Okay, no. right. That's a buttload of planets, man. <laughs> That's a lot of planets. <laughs> That's a lot of planets. And as I said, I wanted to see if I could get two in the habitable zone. Now, if anyone looks at the chart, they'll see my habitable zone is from uh, 1.048 AU to uh, 1.51 AU, which is a pretty good distance apart, seeing as planets um, need to be 0.15 AU apart, according to your videos. So there's hmm. plenty of space there. Yes. So I have one... Uh, just slightly the inside the inner limit at 1.063, and another one quite close to the edge at 1.51. Oh, B- Bill, I like that. Very often when I'm world building systems, I like to try and do that. If I fit multiple uh, planets in the habitable zone, I like to keep them at extremes. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really cool. So then, to me, that would imply that your inner habitable zone planet is going to be like quite warm. 
and your outer one is probably going to be a little bit cooler. And I think that's going to be a really cool sort of yin yang thing going on. Possibly, yeah. I mean, uh, from from what I've looked into it, actually getting the temperature is hugely dependent on atmosphere as well. Yeah, and I think atmosphere is probably beyond the scope of this this, this podcast. Just to, yeah. to say, yeah, A- atmosphere and the albedo are are, are two huge um, two huge factors there. But I'll be able to get them both close to Earth surface temperatures. I think now whether they'll result in breath- breathable atmospheres is another situation for way down the line but <laughs> <laughs> but I, I like your placement i think your placement's really cool now uh so that's so as i said there's six planets and i'll just i'll just go through them real quick there's one that's quite like to Merc- quite similar to mercury close in towards the sun okay there's one the next one um a sort of an iron planet which uh, you described in your poker planets video oh very cool bill I'll, I'll come back to if you're interested in yeah and then there's uh the third one is a sort of a desert planet the sixth one is a good bit further out and is outside the habitable zone. I have ideas for that one as well. But to talk a little bit about, about the desert planet for the moment. Okay. In your Poker Planets video, you say that desert planets could stretch the limits of the habitable zone. Yes. So I'm wondering if it is in fact possible for me to get three planets that are potentially habitable, considering that one of the closer ones is the desert planet. Oh, okay. So how the desert planet, what distance does it orbit its star at? It's, I've currently got it at uh, 0.612. Okay, so that's, uh, the desert planet is at 0.612 and the inner limit of your habitable zone is... 1.048. Now, I have no hard data to like suggest like how far the habitable zone can stretch with a mm-hmm. desert planet. To me, man, I'm really sorry, that strikes me as a little bit far. Yeah, it does. Now, I've looked at a little bit like the Wikipedia articles and stuff on habitable zones and there seems to be a little bit of uh, disagreement like n- not a huge amount of consensus and there there is different situations in which certain papers have suggested habitable planets can be a lot closer to suns yeah so i'm going to look a little bit further into it and by doing some quick surface temperature calculations with a high albedo i can bring the temperature of the planet pretty far down okay oh cool and then as desert planets will have high albedos Exactly. Oh, um, and then sorry. I don't want, I don't need it to be habitable all over. If I just had habitable polar zones, polar regions, exactly, that would be yeah. that would be sufficient. So I'm going to play around with it, and hopefully I can get something useful out of that. Um, for for the listeners, albedo is a measure of how reflective a planet is. Mm-hmm. With one being uh, reflects all of the light, and zero being absorbs all the light. Exactly. So what Bill needs to do is ensure that his planet is very reflective, and that will stretch the limits of the habitable zone. And he can hopefully fit three planets in there. I hope you can get three planets in there. That would be awesome. Me too. <laughs> but, even, but even if but even if you like strictly can't, like the maths doesn't work out. Yeah. This is this is the point with world building that like as long as you have like a literary reason to do so, it's fine. Sure. You know, there's no need to be bound to the maths. And also I can bring it a little bit further away from the sun. If it can be from your videos, it can be a maximum of twice the distance of the, the next closest star. Yeah. Then I can bring it up to 0.68 AU away, which is a good bit further. That's, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, I think, I think you probably will be able to work it. That's cool, man. That's really cool. Three, three, see, I went mental with the stars. You went mental with the habitable planets. <laughs> <laughs> so overall, so just, just as a quick rundown before I discuss my thing, we have one star. How many planets in total? Uh, in total, I have, oh, let me see, 10. You have 10 planets. Oh, geez, you really did go go to, go to town on the planets. So that's six terrestrials, two gas giants, one that's a super Jupiter and one that's kind of like a slightly larger Saturn, and then a small Neptunian planet and then a gas dwarf. Oh, that's some really good mixture of planets. And then, I, you know, I, like I, can, I can fit other like Plutonian planets and dwarf planets and I've got two asteroid belts. So I've got a lot of space for, for large asteroids and kind of wandering, wandering micro planets and things. Oh, that's... Brilliant. That that is that setting sounds really exciting. I like it. I hope so. Uh so anyhow, uh my guy, right? Mm-hmm. So we had my three stars. Three stars. In terms of habitable planets, what I deliberately try to do is have the habitable zone be as uninhabitable as possible. <laughs> <laughs> right? So if people have watched the videos, when you deal with multiple stars, there is a, a thing called the forbidden zone where planets cannot orbit around those stars because of gravity and things like that. And I worked it in such a way that the Forbidden Zone covers most of the Habitable Zone. (laughs) 
<laughs> so I kind of went for I kind I kind of went for like a really contrived system. Like how contrived can I make it and still make it plausible and like it could exist in the real world? Mhm. So I, I I can't remember the exact stats, but I think my habitable zone is about like you know ninety ninety six ninety seven percent useless, right? Very good. <laughs> and so what I've done is in the tiny sliver of habitability that's left, I've dropped the gas giant there. Gas giants, which are known for their habitability, which are exactly which are known for the habitability, and I've decided to wrap an earth like moon around that gas giant. Oh, that's cool. So again, I just tried to play with the idea of make things really uninhabitable, but still be able to get it. Mm -hmm. And part of me also wants to put a Trojan companion to this gas giant that is also Earth-like. That would be very cool. Um, And again, I've made a video on Lagrange Point outlining this. There's a way of getting an extra planet into the same orbit as another planet, basically. Yeah. Um, Could you have a Trojan and a Greek? I mean, it would be a bit silly, but in theory it would be possible, right? Um, No. No. No, I remember, now don't quote me on this internet, but I remember researching um, the Lagrange Point video and I remember reading that it, you're not going to have both. It's just mm-hmm. it's just not going to happen. You're not going to have both be actual like planetary bodies. You can have bits of dust at both. But you can I, have asteroids and things at you, both. Yeah, like Jupiter has its Greek and Trojan asteroids. But yeah, in terms of like habitable Earth-like planets, you're really just going to have one. And that really is only going to be at the L4 and L5 point. The other Lagrange points are out of the question anyways. Mm. Um, so I might do that. So I might get two habitable planets because I kind of want my my um, civilization to be spacefaring, but to be spacefaring without warp drive capability. So they can still interact with other worlds, but they don't need to you know travel across the galaxy to do so. Yeah. So uh, that was my concept for uh, the habitable planets. So very, very contrived. Yours is a lot more natural. It's fairly busy though. <laughs> it's, 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 it's very busy, <laughs> but it's like that's fine. Like again, but like look at Firefly. Yeah, you know, I mean, like if there's a literary reason for it, then then that's that's cool. So so you've got one, you've got one planet in the habitable zone. I do, and maybe a habitable moon, and then a, a, a habitable Trojan. Mm-hmm. What about the rest of the? What about the outer system? Well, can I talk about the inner system first? Yes, of course. Purely because it's it'll, I can do it in one sentence. The first object one would encounter when in tra- traveling from the stars outwards is an asteroid belt. Okay. And uh, I placed that there because it is in the forbidden zone of the binary pair. So I figured maybe a planet started to form there, but then the fact that the gravity is all messy ripped it apart and you have an asteroid belt. Okay. Which I think is pretty cool because we're used to kind of thinking of asteroid belts as being kind of like in a system. Do you know what I mean? Not, yeah. not at the kind of the very first position. So um, I went with that. And also, I assume then that, that would be like really chaotic if it's in the Forbidden Zone. So you'd have asteroids kind of all over the place, be very hard to map, which could be kind of a, a cool thing to have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like a most most like kind of sci-fi or maybe science fantasy settings kind of always have, you know, those backwater sort of planets, you know, the, the uncharted sort of thing. Right. So this can be kind of like the uncharted region. I don't know, it could be, it could be like people like could hang out there. All the bad guys could hang out on my asteroid belt and all that. But yeah, so that's that was my thinking behind that. So we have the asteroid belt, and then we have the gas giant, which we've discussed. Mm-hmm. And then outside of that, I have three rocky planets. Right. And then that's it. That's that's all the planets in my system. I went for few planets. Again, I did the opposite of you. Uh, and these planets, I think, are are kind of cool because they all rely on each other to be able to exist. That is to say that they are in what's known as a Laplace resonance. And so what that is, is that my first rocky planet orbits four times for every two orbits of the next one out, and then for every one orbit of the furthest one out. So the, the, so the, the first planet has a year twice as long as the second planet, and then twice as long as the third planet in order. Uh, a short, twice as short. Twice as short, rather. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And and this is this this is this Laplace resonance happens with Jupiter's moons. I didn't just oh. make oh, yeah, I didn't just make this up. This is a thing that you find in uh, in real life, and the fact that their orbital periods are so tightly locked and related by small integers means that they're inherently very stable. You did a video on this, didn't you, on resonant orbits? I exactly. So I took yeah. the information from the. The dwarf planet video, uh, I think mm-hmm. it was the dwarf planet build video, and applied it to planetary orbits. 
Okay. And my reason for doing so was that um, because I have a gas giant in my habitable zone, it's obviously gas giants don't form in the habitable zone. So my idea was it that the gas giant formed outwards and tore through the system and made everything unstable. And only these three guys survive. These three outer rocky planets survive because they happen to slip into a really kind of bolstering orbital resonance with each other. The resonance supported them against the the chaos of the system otherwise. Exactly, yeah. So the system may, may have had very many other planets like yours, but the fact that the gas giant tore through it, it scattered everything but the three lucky survivors. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting that you've thought about the, the history of the of the system. Mm-hmm. And you've you've created this thing that has has a history, and what has happened is it has influenced the system that you're actually presenting to us, right? Because uh, I've done a little bit of that. Oh, good, very good. As I said, the second planet was uh, an iron planet, like ones that you mentioned in your videos, mm-hmm. and I thought a little bit about how that might come about. You said it, it could possibly be as the result of an impact. Exactly. Yeah. So that's what I was thinking that maybe my second planet was had been, a, you know, a more Earth-like composition, but then some catastrophe stripped away all the rocky stuff and left you know, a little bit of rock, but mostly this iron core. Yeah. Uh, so I've, I've thought a little bit about, about that in terms of how that planet formed. And I was wondering then, actually, this kind of ties in as well, would some of that material have gone to the asteroid belt, or one of the two asteroid belts, or could it have formed Trojan and Greek followers? I'd imagine the asteroid belt would be more plausible. Okay. Um, because I don't know, like off the top of my head, I don't know. I have to run calculations. But I'd imagine that the Iron Planet would not be massive enough to hold on to partners. Really? Yeah. I mean, like Earth has like Lagrangian partners, but they're like, they're like minute bits of dust. Nothing okay. significant at all. And I think there is a reason why we find most of the stuff around Jupiter just because it's so incredibly massive. Yeah. I just figured because it, it would already have been in that orbital neighborhood that it might not stray all that far. But but why couldn't uh, couldn't it form a moon of the planet though? I suppose it could, yeah. That might be a cool idea. I or, suppose they think that, that that might have been what happened to Earth, don't they? That's a, exactly, that's yeah. One of the theories about how Earth's moon formed. So you could have like an iron planet orbited by a, like a silicate moon. Yeah, that might be cool. Or do you know what you could set up as well? You could set up uh, like a geologically in, uh, unstable ring system. So it's always getting bombarded. Uh, well, yeah, but like imagine like the impact happened relatively recently. And the stuff hasn't had a chance to, like, fly off into yeah. space. And it's just trapped in the orbit of the Iron Planet. That's pretty cool. Yeah, you could have... That, there's, I, there's a lot of, sort of, evocative storytelling opportunities there. Definitely. And it makes for really interesting locales. Mm. Um, so we have this iron this iron world with potential mm-hmm. with a potential ring system. Um, yeah. Uh, do you have any other ideas for the rest of your planets? Like, what, what are you thinking about... What sort of setting are you thinking about running on them? So, as I said, I'm talking about this kind of Barsoomian idea. The main planet, the fourth one, is intended to be the most Earth-like planet. Props on not making the third planet the main planet. Yeah, <laughs> that was exactly what I wanted to avoid. <laughs> well done, I like it. So the fourth planet is the main, the main Earth-like world. Yes. Okay, cool, very good. Now, as I said, I might have these, other, these two other habitable systems, or habitable planets, and I was thinking about, you know, taking this sort of trope of the humans traveling to other planets and how they behave there. In in the Barsoom series, he goes to Mars mm-hmm. and he's much stronger because Mars has such less gravity. Exactly. So he's yeah. able to jump huge distances and he's able to lift heavy things because he's used to combating gravity that's like twice as strong or something. I think I think Mars is a half or slightly less than half of Earth's yeah. gravity. Yeah. So I wanted to keep that. I thought that was a pretty cool idea that someone would go to another planet and because, just because they came from somewhere with heavier gravity, they'd be stronger. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So the third and fifth planets have lighter gravity. These are the other two potentially habitable ones. So that was something that I thought would be would be cool. Oh, and cool. then, I mean, seeing as they're habitable, I can do similar things. I can fill them with, you know, strange beasts and aliens and jungles and seas and things. So they're quite sort of classic uh, and obviously then the, the third one is the desert planet. So that's uh, got a lot of cultural history to it, you know, like Dune and so, so many. Uh, Tatooine as well. So there's kind of a lot of things I can draw on there. Now, the iron planet, as I said, you know, could be bombarded, or as you said, could be bombarded by these rings. I thought it might be kind of interesting to have 
something quite alien there, like a very, very alien life form that is metallic. Oh, Bill, I, I'm I'm totally with you here. <laughs> I love it. That's that's brilliant. Uh, I think there's a little bit of information in my Poker Planet videos about the chemical makeup of Iron Planets. Um, mm-hmm. So perhaps that's something to look into. Like, can you use sure. any of those uh, elements as, or any of those compounds as a solvent for life? I'll I'll have another look. Cool. And then the final planet of the the final terrestrial planet, the sixth one, mm. is slightly larger than Earth and a good bit heavier and has slightly higher gravity. So instead of being one uh, g, it's one point three g. So it's about a third stronger gravity. Right. Okay. Cool. And what I was thinking with that one was this could be sort of Lovecraftian. Oh, nice. That it's populated by, you know, huge sluggish aliens and they they abduct creatures from the other planets and take them back here to, you know, be slaves and building, you know, insane monuments to the eldritch gods or to be sacrifices or whatever. Oh, and that's so good. The reason I gave it higher gravity is because I think that adds to the the oppressive atmosphere of it. So not only are you, like, taken away and being experimented upon by, you know, tentacled beasts from beyond the stars, but, you know, even breathing Will is be more laborious. difficult than before. Even moving yeah. is is more difficult than it should be. So it's the opposite of going to, going to Barsoom and being superhumanly strong and heroic. Your very existence is oppressing you because of the gravity. That is... Brilliant. That's probably the best thing you've said so far. That is class. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people, like, a lot of world builders ask me, why bother with all these stats and all this math? And, and like, I think what you said there kind of, like, makes the point that if you build, like, the physical parameters of the world, they're not just numbers. Like, they really can influence a story. Mm-hmm. So that number, 1.3G, has, like, sparked an entire setting, you know, and has, like, kind of relevance to a narrative like i love it i think it's great great thank you very much man no worries man <laughs> and so uh, do we have so those are the terrestrial worlds those are the terrestrial worlds and, yeah. and do we have any plans uh for your gas giants and your obviously your ice dwarfs and that sort of thing not as of yet no i mean i want to have a pretty uh pretty stacked system around like of, of moons around the super jupiter um right you'll know, see what i can do about having interesting things to explore there obviously they're far away from the habitable zone but people do speculate that they're you know which one is a titan could that titan yeah. could hold life mm-hmm. um, uh, no wait hold on is it europa is it europa or titan it's one of one of the moons yes one of the moons one of the jovian moons anyway so you know i could i could possibly do something with that um and if not you know i can have a look at it anyway and you know make a cool system um interesting interactions between the various satellites and then the Neptunian and the Gas Dwarf, uh, there's not a huge amount I can do with that, with those in regards to humanoid life, but there's always space for weird aliens and things. Yeah, and I think um, as well it's a good idea to kind of keep some of a system kind of unexplored. Oh, totally, yeah. Yeah, or, or, just, or even just useless to the inhabitants of the rest of the system. Yeah. You know, like the people just pay no attention to the Gas Dwarf because, you know what, it's just a hunk of gas, no one cares. And it's way far away. And it's way <laughs> far away, exactly, exactly. So, um... I, I, I like I like the fact that you've like fully fleshed out the the six inner and then the outer ones are still kind of mysterious and I, mm. that's really cool. And as I said, I mean, there's two asteroid belts and you know with the, what we know about the solar system, there's so many other objects out there. You know, there's oh, all yeah. the dwarf planets. So, so I could you know there, there, I could have a haunted asteroid, no problem. There's lots of places <laughs> I could put that, or I could have a dwarf planet that's the lair of an evil space wizard. I mean. Yeah, no, there's, there's solar systems are big, man. Yeah, they're, they're very big. Not small things at all. I I once um tried to have a setting that was entirely set in the Kuiper Belt. Cool. Or like not our Kuiper Belt, but a Kuiper Belt. Yeah. Um, because just purely because you can fit so many objects in the Kuiper Belt, mm-hmm. and uh, they're so like close together. Again, the issue of travel is lessened, and that was really interesting. I might actually revive something like that. Uh, obviously, the big thing is that it's like zero habitability, so it's all like colonies. I mean, the Kuiper Belt is huge, so they're not all close together. Well, like, they are... Or, or do you mean that, like, a region of the Kuiper Belt? 
No, just even I know the Kuiper Belt is huge, but like the the density of the objects is way more than than normal space in the inner solar system. Right. Yeah. Um, I so gotcha. yeah, so you don't have to travel vast, vast distances. But but yeah, so Bill, I again, I envy you as a sort of like storyteller. You, you really you really do come up with really cool settings. Like I'm the kind of stats nerd. I love working with numbers, but you like really bring them to life. It's class. Well, let's see if the the setting, if the stories are actually any good, though. That's that's the next step. <laughs> well, this is true. This is true. The kind of that makes it or breaks it. So I have my ideas for my system are kind of very dystopian. Good. Uh, <laughs> in the oh, I se- like dystopias. No, dystopia is really good. I like bleak things, bleak, dark, that sort of thing, in the sense that almost nothing is inhabitable or is inhabited in my system. So, like, the outer three planets aren't inhabited. There might be, like, mining colonies, but they're all going to be, like, really kind of, like, dark and dingy and no one wants to be there because it's so far away from, like, any sort of, like, civilization. So, really, all that's going to happen is that the Earth-like moon and possibly the Lagrangian uh, Earth-like planet will be kind of, like, bustling metropolises. Yeah. And then everything else is just used for consumption and used for, like, gain and things like that. So I could work in, uh, you know, commentary about, like, capitalism and things like that. It's not as exciting as your idea, but I like barren things. For sure. No, there's there's, there's a lot of uh, opportunities to talk about stuff there. That's great. Have you um have you ever come across Eclipse Phase? Eclipse Phase? Yeah. I, I don't know what this is. What is this? It's a very interesting little RPG. Okay. Um, it's made by guys called Posthuman Games. All right. Or Posthuman Studios or something, and it's set in our solar system, but after a, a cataclysm has eradicated Earth, pretty much. Oh, cool. And humanity, or post or transhumanity, depending how you look at it, is has colonized the solar system. All right. Okay. And one of the central themes of it is economic and ideological conflict between the inner system, which is uh, economically conservative and traditional. You know, it's got, you know, actual money and proper countries and things um, out as far as Jupiter. And then the rest of it, and scattered in various places throughout, is more uh, more anarchist. Yeah, I was thinking anarchist, yeah. Yeah, so it it has, it, it can have money, or it they can have sort of like reputation based currencies, which are quite well fleshed out. Oh, that's so really interesting. It, it's really interesting from that point of view, and it's also got a lot of sort of survival horror, Love, Lovecraftian kind of kind of horror cool. themes, and transhumanity. So you know, you're you're you have stats for your mind, but then your mind can be put in different bodies, and and how that all plays up. It does, it does quite a good thing of using all of the different kind of elements of the solar system, kind of like I've got. I've got, you know, everywhere is, has kind of got something going on or potentially has something going on. They do that here, you know, there's, there's people who have colonized Titan, there's people who have colonized Neptune, and there's uh, space research like really close to the sun. But it's also really bleak because it's post-apocalyptic. I like the sound of that. Well, what's this called? It's called Eclipse Phase. It's a Eclipse it's a open source RPG, so you can you can download all the PDFs for free. Oh, cool! Really cool. Nothing has been done on it in a few years, as far as I know. They they may have stopped supporting it. the The company may no longer be um, active, but you know it's it's there and it's worth a look. I think. I will look into it because it sounds like their interests and my interests are quite aligned here. Mm-hmm. The thing about about your system, the this the thing about the the trapped star. Yeah. Now, I'm going to have to backtrack a little when, when I'm saying this, but I did have, have a thought about adding another element to my system. Oh, okay. And this is based on something I read about brown dwarfs, just, you know, kind of looking up on Wikipedia or whatever, that it was thought that there may be a brown dwarf orbiting our sun. Yeah, Nemesis, isn't it? Nemesis, yeah. Yeah. And I, I also read that it's been hypothesized that you could have a habitable zone around a brown dwarf. So, how far out could you realistically have a brown dwarf around a system like this? Would it have to be kind of within the the forty percent or the, the forty times luminosity range of your of your video, or could it be a little bit further? Could it be kind of like in the Kuiper Belt? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. I think the safest thing to do is uh, in my what is it called the Battlestar Galactica video. Mm-hmm. 
where I show you how to make a Battlestar Galactica like system. I, I give a range for distant companions. Right. Now, off the top of my head, I cannot remember what that range is, but I think that will probably be the safest to go with. And then if you ramp up the eccentricity of the orbit of your brown dwarf, it could take it into the Kuiper Belt, in and out of the Kuiper Belt. Okay. Uh, I don't think you could have it like on a circular orbit sitting in the middle of the Kuiper Belt. And that would probably like clean up the Kuiper Belt a lot. Like it would probably draw up a lot of the stuff out there. Exactly. Or just send a ton of comets into the inner solar system, which might yeah. be a, might be a cool idea. But yeah, like uh, I think it's going to be outside. I think it's going to be more akin to my, uh, my distant star. It'll be more akin to, to an actual companion. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I, I think that's the, what the Nemesis hypothesis was about. I think it's a, a companion, not actually a brown dwarf in the actual system. Okay. Well, I, I figured I, I that could, it would be like a, a trans-Plutonian brown dwarf, but I didn't realize it would... Because, I mean, like a brown dwarf is, what, like 20 Jupiter masses, maybe? I, I, the figure that pops in my head is 13 times mass of Jupiter, but I, I can't verify that, you know, speaking ad lib. Yeah. Yeah, 13... 13 Jupiter masses starts to fuse deuterium. Cool. Right, okay, cool, yeah. Yeah, so it's 13 Jupiter masses, which isn't, which is like a lot less than, than solar masses. Oh yeah, much, much less. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with wrapping a brown dwarf around your system. Why cool. would you wrap a brown dwarf around your system? What's the storytelling aspect? Well, that it would give me, a, a potentially give me another habitable planet, but one that would be really, really alien. So as you said, you know, if it, if it was very far away, then you get transported there, and you don't know what this is, and there's like a huge, huge brown dwarf in the sky. And I just, I just think there's a kind of a cool aesthetic to the idea of a planet around a brown dwarf, and there's no other way for me to fit it in. <laughs> I, I, I say go for it. Yeah. I think that'd be really cool. Or you could, like, ooh, it's a bit dodgy, but could you upgrade your Super Jupiter to a brown dwarf? Hmm. Oh, but I so, suppose maybe that takes away the kind of, like, uh, the distance aspect. Yeah. And I mean, it's it's a big upgrade. Like my, my Super Jupiter at the moment is like 2.6 times Jupiter mass. So I'm like doubling that to get up to a, to a brown dwarf. Yeah, and it's probably going to wreak havoc oh, not, on not everything. I'm doubling that. I'm, I'm like multiplying up like six to get it up to a, a Jupiter mass. Yeah, and it's probably going to wreak havoc on your... Because your, your, your system's quite tightly packed. Yeah. So I think it's probably wreak havoc on that. I, I say go for it. Stick a brown dwarf there. It's If it's got a good literary reason, go for it. Yeah, I'll, I'll have a think about it. And if it is a distant one, and it's on, like, an eccentric orbit, having it swing by a Kuiper Belt is brilliant, because, like, it'll, it'll send sh- comets showering into the inner system. Yeah, like, every every thousand years. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So then, I mean, like, the inhabitants of your system, like, may know that there is something, but they don't, like, they can't see it or whatever, because it's not, like, radiating energy. Exactly. Um, and then when it comes to actually being able to, like, you know, develop the technology to get there, like, it could be this really grim, dark, horrible place. Like, it could be really cool. hmm So I think we've, I think we've discussed these systems fairly well. Yeah? Yeah, no, we've, we've learned a lot. I hope we've painted a good enough picture of what they're like, because it's, it's, it's very hard to communicate in audio form. Uh, something that is like you know physical and um, so therefore go in the show notes have a look there'll be stat sheets i may even do some photoshopping and come up with like little maps and things i don't know uh we'll see how <laughs> time goes but yeah so do you, do you have anything else to add before we uh wrap this guy up bill um i've got one very quick question go for it so this is about uh to return to the the very inside of my system right okay my first planet is 0.17 au from the star Yes. And the next one is twice that, 0.34. Okay. Now, that's pretty close together. If the, the closest they can be is 0.15, that's only 0.02 AU away. So it's very, very close. Yes. Is this potentially too close? If I like bring start to consider eccentricity in this, could it be that they would get be more than 0.15 together and that would upset things, do you think? Okay, uh, that's an interesting question. I would say that it has to be on average. Okay. If on average they're within 0.15 AU, they're going to be unstable. If they happen to like, if something happens to dip below 0.15 every so often or something, that's not too bad. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't worry too much. Also though, the eccentricity of your inner planets, because you said these are the first two planets. Yeah. They're going to be, it's going to be pretty low, I think. Oh, uh, inner planets have low eccentricity. Well, yeah, Mercury's a weird one. Like Mercury's a weird one in our system, but generally like we're talking circles. Like, I know every planet, uh, like, orbits on an ellipse, but, like, 
they're so circular, it's not okay. even funny. So I wouldn't like I wouldn't go putting an eccentricity value of like 0. 0.5. That that would just be ludicrous. <laughs> um, so I don't think I don't think you'd have a problem if you stick with like terrestrial planet like eccentricities. Cool. But again, I just want to reiterate because it's really important. If you have a good literary reason, just go for it. You know. There's no point being like, oh, well, I can't tell my story because, you know, planet A fell within 0.15 AU of planet B. And then, oh, God, it's all it's all over. May as well start again, you know? Yeah, and it can take, you know, millions of years for that stuff to actually become stable. So maybe your story is luckily set in the, the window before things all, you know, head south. Within any humanoid lifetime, everything is pretty much stable, <laughs> you know? So that's, that's, I always tell myself that because, you know. It takes millions of years for these things to happen. Mm -hmm. Good question, though. That was a really good question. It was really matzy. I like it. Did you have fun talking about planetary systems, Bill? Did I? It was a great crack. I love it. I think we should do more of this world building thing. Agreed. I think this is actually really fun. And it's better than just listing off, you know, this is the planetary system from X series and from X TV show. It's like, you know, the thing's better. Definitely. Will we call it there and head into the green room? I think so. Cool. Let's do that. See you in a bit, Bill. See you there. <laughs> so welcome to the green room, Bill. Hello, Edgar. Thank you for, for having me. Based on the last episode of the podcast, I did a bit more uh, interior decorating. I can see that. Uh, and I hope you appreciate the giant flag of Nordic Libya um, on the main wall. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Do you see what I did there, Bill? Hey, that, that, oh. That's what we in the comedy business call a callback. Oh, very good. Yeah, you see, I don't have a word for it because it's just natural. You're just you're just a natural comedian. I'm Edgar. just I'm just naturally hilarious. <laughs> but anyhow, for those of you who didn't uh, listen to the last episode, the green room is a place where me and Bill talk a little bit more informally uh, about our lives, and not really with anything to do with world building, just just what's going on with us. Um, so I suppose I'll open Bill. Please do uh, by saying that I went to the cinema. A few days ago? Two, oh, three days ago? Well, something cool. like that. What did you see? I saw Paper Towns. Oh, the John Green? Yeah, the John oh, Green, the with, second. Uh, Ka- Cara Delevingne and Miles Teller, is it? Oh, I don't know the actors, no. Cara Delevingne sounds right. I've been hearing a lot about her names. I think it is, yeah. Yeah, I went to see that because I, I like the, the cinema's really dodgy these days. There's not much on. There really is not much on. If the choice between Inside Out and that. And Inside Out wasn't screening late at night. So we went to see Paper Towns, myself and the captain. And I knew John Green was a good writer. I haven't read his books, but no one has ever spoke uh, poorly of John Green's writing. Mm -hmm. Um, And I thought the film was very good. Okay. I really enjoyed the film. And for what it is, for like the YA and sort of coming of age sort of thing, it was really interestingly presented. And the characters are like, they're very kind of grey like I couldn't decide whether or not I really like him or really hate him and I couldn't decide whether or not they're moral or immoral and it was really good okay. I, I was pleasantly surprised and the funny thing is um, when the, when the screening uh, ended uh, in the row behind me there was obviously a couple on a date and clearly the girl was a fan of John Green and the lad was just dragged along because she turned around to him and was like, wasn't that amazing? And he was like, that was the most disappointing thing I have ever seen in my entire <laughs> life. And I know, it was just brilliant. And his deadpan delivery was awesome. So yeah, I, I, essentially I watched a movie by a, a YouTuber slash author that I admire and it was good. Cool. What have I been watching recently? Uh, Bojack Horseman, which is very good. What in the name of God is that? You've not heard of Bojack Horseman? No. It's on um, it's on Netflix. Okay. And it released its second season about a month ago. All right. And it's a cartoon about a a guy called Bojack Horseman who is a horse actor, uh, like a like a anthropomorphic horse person. Oh, okay. Who was a, a star of a sitcom in the nineteen nineties, and he's now this sort of like washed up actor in his fifties. And it's a really funny comedy about like his his hijinks and. You know, him having crazy adventures and things. And the like a lot of people in it are, are animals as well. So his agent is a cat person and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of kind of humor drawn out of, you know, animal people. But it's also a, a really, really 
upsetting, really gripping drama about a very, very broken man who doesn't know how to fix himself. That sounds ridiculous. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds brilliant. I was confused there. You cleared, you cleared it up at the end, but I was confused. Like, I didn't know, I didn't know where you're referring to, like, a man who played horses in films or a, a literal horse man, like a centaur of some description. No, he's he's a horse person. He's, a, no, he's, he's not a centaur. He's he's like he's got a he's got a, a horse head. And it, but he's a human. No, he's a horse. No, he's a horse, right? Yeah. So so he's like a bipedal horse. Yeah. Right. Okay. And oh, and so the rest of this universe is filled with bipedal animals of some description. Well, it's got like a lot of humans as well. It's got normal humans. Yeah. But but like, it's it's <laughs> our it's our world. Like it's it's set in LA. Does no one does no one question the animals? No, because in their setting, they've always had it. So why would they question it? <laughs> it'd be like going... It'd be, it'd be like it was like, Edgar, why are there blonde people? What's that all about? Oh, I... That... <laughs> I may check that out. That sounds... Yeah, it's it's really good. It's it's very good. And it's got some, some great um, some great voice talent in it as well. Like some, some actors that I really like are in it doing voices. Oh, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> what else? I think that's that's all I've, I've been watching recently. I've watched a little bit of comedy... I started watching The Fuzz, which is a, actually a very similar kind of kind of premise. It's a, a cop show, and it's set in New York, but there are puppets living alongside humans. Puppets? Yeah, like, so like, 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 like J- Jim Henson puppets. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm not, I'm not, there's only five episodes so far. I'm not, I'm not gone on it yet. I've, I've watched two, and I'm, I'm still kind of on the fence. None um, of this makes any sense to me. <laughs> what? what? There's, there's puppets. <laughs> Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I have to gather myself here. Uh, <laughs> um, but on the topic of TV, yes. did you see that uh, IMDb have uh, released a, 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 a user list for the top 250 TV shows? No, I haven't, Bill. What, what's, what's this about? Okay, so you know how IMDb, they have the list of the top 250 films? Yes. And I actually, did we do that a few times when we were living together? We were looking for films to watch and we'd, we'd like pick stuff off the list that no one had seen. Oh, I think so. Oh, yeah. uh, interesting subject on that. My my brother has watched all 250. Wow. Uh, give or take, there's some, I think he said there's some French ones in there that are like ridiculously hard to find. Right. Um, but for everything that is available, he's watched it. Fun game. Look at the bottom yeah. 100 or the bottom 250 and see how many you've seen. A funner game. Look at the bottom 250 and watch all the bottom 250. <laughs> I watched Super Babies. Oh dear. Have you have you seen Super Babies? No. Oh, it's awful. <laughs> There's one I really want to see in it called uh, "Who's Your Caddy." Oh, I think I know that one. Um, is it uh, no? Is it? It's either Adam Sandler or your man. Ma- is it Martin Lawrence? Well, it, it is. It is a mostly a black cast. Yeah. Um, is, is Martin Lawrence in it? I I, I don't know, oh, but I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be Martin Lawrence over Adam Sandler if it's a choice between the two. Right. Right. Okay. Um. No. Uh. Martin Lawrence is not in it. Oh, I seem to remember he is. I, I know what you're on about, though, because I like I have frequented the bottom 250 quite a bit, so. Uh, I really want to see it because it's got Big Boy from Outcast in it. Big Boy. The, he's the guy. He's like the, not the thin guy. The rapper. They, like the guy who raps more than sings. Okay, I think I'm almost the same guy. You know, in the Outcast video, he's not the guy who's every member of the band. No, he, that's that's Andre. That's Andre. Okay, good. We're on the same boy. Oh, okay, so he's he's in. There's, uh, there's a whole discussion about that and and that era of Outcast that we could have, but that's for for another time. Um, yeah, <laughs> Big Boy is is in this golf film. Oh, look out! Hip hop golf film. I take it. It's, and it's, like, it's meant to be terrible. <laughs> you you said it's a hip hop golf film. Like I I don't think those words could could like mean a good film. Like. <laughs> Well, it's got Big Boy in it. <laughs> and I think it's got... I'm just looking at it here. Apparently it's got Lil Wayne as well. <laughs> oh, that sounds horrendous. Oh, are you on the uh, the 250 list at the moment? No, I just looked it up on Wikipedia. Oh, okay, okay. Um, I actually use Wikipedia to look up films more than I, I use IMDb. Really? I prefer the format, yeah. I really? don't like I don't like the way IMDb is laid out as much. I like Wikipedia. Yeah, that's, that's 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 a fair point. I like IMDb because I can read the reviews. Mm. You know, that's probably the only thing. But anyhow, anyhow, sorry. So, like, uh, typical Edgar and Bill, is, uh, we have a tangent. We were talking about... Oh, the TV shows, the top 250. The top 250 TV shows as voted by IMDb users. Cool. I think this is uh, 
Maybe it's maybe it's always been there, but I think it's a fairly recent thing. I've never seen it before. Oh, cool. Very good, very good. Oh, let's do a quick fire round. Okay, let's... well I've got the list open, so Cool, cool. <laughs> let's let's go through let's go through top ten, right? Okay. And really quickly say yay or nay to having seen it, and then maybe discuss some of the more interesting ones. Yeah? Okay. So right. I'll, I'll I'll start off. Go for it. I'll do the whole thing. Number one is Band of Brothers. I have seen this. Yeah, I've seen it. Okay. Number two, Planet Earth. That's the documentary. I have, well, I can't say I've seen all of it. I've seen some of it. Yeah, I've, I've seen I've seen snippets of it. Number three, Breaking Bad. I've seen this. Seen it. Number four, Game of Thrones. I watched to the end of season three. I have seen everything up to date. Number five, The Wire. Seen it. Seen it. Oh, well, no, I have seen the first season. You've seen the first season. I've seen it all. Okay, right. Number six and number seven, I'm going to say these together. Um, number six is Cosmos, A Space Time Odyssey which I think is pretty much a remake of number seven, Cosmos, the 1980s one with Carl Sagan. With Carl Sagan, yeah, yeah. Uh, I have seen the remake. Okay, I haven't seen either. Uh, so I'm keeping a tally here of how many I've seen. All right, go for uh, it. Number eight is The Sopranos, I have I've mostly seen. I've seen none of it. I've seen a fair bit of it. Okay, number nine is The World at War, which as far as I can tell, I'm not familiar with it. It looks like it was a documentary series from the 70s. Oh, okay. No, I haven't seen it. And number 10 is Sherlock, the British one, the, the, the recent one with Benedict Cumberbatch. Have you seen it? I have not. I have not seen it either. It's meant to be very good. Well, I've, I've heard it's the 10th best TV show of all time. I <laughs> <laughs> Apparently so. I mean, I don't know where I heard that. I, I, I've I've got in the back of my head someone someone made a list or something. Okay, now give me two seconds here. I'm just I'm just quickly compiling my own top ten. Um, just bear with me. As in your your favorite ten TV shows? Yeah. Uh, this this will take literally two seconds. So d- don't worry. Um, hang in there. How while while I'm doing this, how many how many of those ten did you see? I've seen six. Uh, I've seen. Like, even if I haven't seen the full thing, I'll count Band of Brothers, Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, The Wire, uh, The Sopranos. So, that is five. Oh, okay. Oh, usually I'm pretty, I'm not, not too good with TV. Usually most people out, out, out view me. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, I, I, I am unable to make a top ten. I can make a top five. Okay. All right, okay, you ready? Sure. Number one. Uh, the Next Generation. <laughs> number two, <Okay. laughs> Battlestar Galactica, the remake. Uh, okay. no- number three, Deep Space Nine. Number four, the original series, Star Trek. And number five, Voyager. And then, frankly, from there on in, it really is irrelevant. Voyager? Well, no, because... <laughs> <do, do>, do... <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, okay. I... Rules about Voyager, okay? Right. I- I'm going to ban myself from discussing Voyager from this point on. For for a while, at least. <laughs> yeah, or maybe until I finish the, the 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 whole thing. Okay. But really quickly, I want to say that I've met seven of nine, mm-hmm. and species. What is it? Eight four seven two. Yeah, whatever it is. And it is picking up. Okay. Like all Star Trek, hit the fourth se- uh, season and it begins to get better. I'm still not blown away, but Seven of Nine is a very interesting character, and the bad guys, like the the evil alien races they meet, are are beginning to get more kind of like I'm beginning to care about them more it's not just stupider Klingons anymore it's not just stupider Klingons so that is all I'm going to say about uh, Voyager for <laughs> at least several months okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, anyhow so uh, on, on the top 10 there well, do you agree with this top 10 um, do you agree with Band the Butter Brothers being number 1 I mean I haven't sat down and watched it through from start to finish I have seen all of it in in bits and pieces from other people watching it and uh, okay, I've like followed right. it for a few episodes at a time. It's really good. Yeah. Like it is, it is really, really good. And that, what I love about it is that it is true stories and that it has, it's cut with interviews from the actual people. So you have Damien Lewis being cool as Colonel Winter for an episode. And then at the end, you have an interview with actual Colonel Winters. Yeah. I mean, that's really cool. And there's just, there's some, there's so, such, I mean, wonderful. Some of it is wonderful, but obviously the horror of war, like such amazing, powerful moments in it. Like there's the the episode with the concentration camp is one of the most upsetting things I've ever seen on TV. Like, yeah, um, I 
I didn't like it. Really? Yeah, I, I, this is, it's not a comment on any of the points you just mentioned. I, th- I just don't like historical wartime series. Okay. Give me a war drama set in space, that's fine. Give me a war drama set in medieval times, you know, with fantasy elements, that's fine. But something, I, I don't know, it's something about when it's real world and it's like World War II sort of thing. I just, it just doesn't engage with me. You just don't like real human suffering. I, do, I, do you know what, Bill? I don't like real human suffering. I would prefer if real humans didn't have to suffer. Anything on the list, Bill, that you think should not be there? I, I think it's kind of strange to, to try and compare documentaries with dramas. I was stuff. just about to say, yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that Planet Earth isn't class, because from what I've seen, it is pretty class. But you can't, you can't compare, compare Planet Earth and Band of Brothers. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very... Well, I suppose Band of Brothers has the documentary element from the interviews, but you can't compare it with Breaking Bad. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's true. That's very true. I don't think the, that Game of Thrones is the fourth best TV show of all time. Are you a Game of Thrones fan? Yeah, not not without some reservations. I mean, I like I like the books, what I've read of the books. I've read as far as... I haven't finished the, the last one that was published. Yeah, I'm same. I got about maybe four or five chapters into the last one, and then I kind of was like, okay, enough Game of Thrones. Uh, no, I was really enjoying it. I just, I put it down somewhere in my house and then forgot where I put it. Um, oh, here, I can give you my copy. Th- oh, no, no, I, I found it since, but that was like six months later. So okay. I wasn't just going to like, I couldn't just pick back up right in the middle because it's so kind of complex. Oh, 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 can I interrupt? Something just popped into my head. Yeah. Do you remember um, Octacon? Yeah. Okay, so for um, listeners who aren't in Ireland, Octacon is like a, um, how would you call it? Like a convention? It's a convention. A science fiction, or um, yeah, science fiction and fantasy convention. Yeah, a science fiction and fantasy convention, exactly. And I went there one year with yourself. Yep. George R. R. Martin was the guest of honor, and he he was on on very many panels, etc. But he did a reading of I think it was a, was it a chapter from Feast for Crows? No, it was from A Dance with Dragons. Is it from A Dance with Dragons? Yeah. Um, and oh god, it was the worst. <laughs> do, you, do you remember? Were you there for that? Do you remember that? I was there. I don't remember it being awful. Oh, so boring. Like, like he's a very good writer. His books are excellent. His storytelling is is wonderful. And I like him as a world builder as well. But, he, oh man, he really can't hold you. He hasn't got a captivating voice. <laughs> and it went on for so long. And I, I, I like, halfway through, I was like, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go outside for a little bit. I just, <laughs> I, I just, I didn't want to pay too much attention because I hadn't gotten, I hadn't finished A Feast for Crows at that stage. So I, I wasn't really listening in case I spoiled a load of stuff. Uh, funny, I'm not, I'm not, I'm fine with spoilers. So I, I hadn't, I think I'd only read up until the third book. Is the third book split in two? The third one is split in two, yeah. Yeah, so the first part of the third one I began reading. And I was right. just like, I don't, I don't care. If I find out what happens later, I, I, you know, who cares? I can still read the book and drive enjoyment from how did we get to that spoiler. Hmm. One last point on the Game of Thrones uh, thing. I am I'm kind of with you. I don't think it's the fourth best of all time. And I think it's probably there very much because it's in the public eye at the moment. Yeah. I think given time, it might drop a little bit. Overall, I like the series. It's getting a bit too dark for me. Yeah. I mean, as I said, I haven't really watched it since season three. I, I, I actually haven't finished season three. Right. Uh, I've, I've seen it for the second last episode. But from what I've seen on forums and, and like Facebook and stuff, people are saying that it's gone from being a TV show that doesn't cheat to help the good guys to being one that does cheat to help the bad guys. Exactly, yeah. It, it seems a bit contrived and it's, it's and it's it's almost like you're just solicit, uh, soliciting a reaction from the audience and you're kind of like, you know, yeah. don't, don't do that. So I've heard. But I'm still going to finish it when, when the rest of us comes out. I'm still going to finish it and mm. see it through. Have you finished Breaking Bad? That's number three on the list. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You finished it? Yeah, yeah. Cool. What do you think? Third place? I would be inclined to put it higher. Really? I I think Breaking Bad is a masterpiece of work. I think it's brilliant. Hmm. <laughs> I take it from your action, you put it lower. Um, no, I, I don't know. I mean, I I know that I there was stuff that I, I, I was a little critical of around the time it ended, but I, I still think overall it's it's a it's a it's a fantastic work. I thought um, the ending was weak. Yeah, it wasn't. It wasn't amazing. It wasn't amazing, and it, yeah, it was it cool. <laughs> yeah, it was. Well, all of Breaking Bad was cool, but it didn't have the sort of like punch. And there was also that one episode in 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 the middle of it there, Bill, that we all agree is just <laughs> one of the worst episodes ever committed to television. 
No, we don't. <laughs> Let me see. Give me a rundown of those those ten again. Let's see if I have anything to say about the other ones. Band of Brothers. Yes. Planet Earth. Breaking Bad. Game of Thrones. The Wire. Cosmos and Cosmos. The Sopranos. World at War and Sherlock. Okay. The Wire. All right. The Wire. So I watched the first season of The Wire. Mm-hmm. And it's not that I didn't like The Wire. And it's not that I don't see why it's great. I just, I found it really hard to follow. Really? Like, yeah, like, like proper, like I had to struggle with stuff. And after episodes, I had to like turn them off and sit there and really think about it, which could be argued is a good thing. You know, if you have to think about the work, that's fine. Um, mm-hmm. But because of the way it was presented with like stuff happening off screen uh, and characters like referring to these events you've never seen, like that was really hard for me to get because I think it's the first time I ever experienced that in a TV show. And I just, right. I, I did not know how to deal with it. I was like, who, what, when did this happen? And then I realized, oh yeah, no, it, it didn't technically happen from my perspective. Yeah, I see what you mean. But I totally can acknowledge that it, that it's great. That's amazing. Um, I, I think it's, I think it's absolutely magnificent. Uh, what, what number is the wire at? It's the fifth. Uh, objectively speaking, I think that might need to be a little bit higher as well. I would put it above Game of Thrones and I'd, I'd, I'm not, sh- I'd probably put it above Breaking Bad. And you see, the weird thing about that then, Bill, is that, you know, that has had time to like mellow out. Um, yeah. So you'd, you'd imagine that that would be sort of like final-ish ranking. Mm. Um, whereas you can see a bit of drift with Game of Thrones. So I think that's that's a bit low for The Wire. Of course, it's it's ranking, like it, it could go up if Game of Thrones goes down. Like it might go up above Game of Thrones if people... Once the Game of Thrones hype dies, uh, of course, yeah, that, yeah. That, this is very true. This is very true. Um, so, like, well, there might not be much voting anymore on the wire. It could still change its position, and of course, if if this list is new, then the voting mightn't have have you know kind of e- evened out yet. Exactly. Maybe there's uh, uh, we have the, we have hope of having the next generation at number one still. <laughs> uh, another one thing I like about the wire is it has, I think, two of the funniest scenes I've ever seen on TV. All right, go for it. Well, I, I I don't want to go into it and, and give stuff away, but there's there's two scenes in particular, um, one I think in the third season and one in the fifth, which are so like so uproariously hilarious that like I would put it with anything I've seen in a comedy show, just incredibly well written, incredibly clever situations. Um, really, like yeah, the like wire, it's it's the it's, it's a, a really show. funny show. Huh. Because it's like it's about like real people in a lot of ways, you know, and it's it's kind of dark and gritty and stuff. But like, funny stuff does happen in real life, and you just like when you get to know the characters and things. I think they, you know, they can. Th- there is levity in in amongst all of the you know inner city grimness. Are you referring to the swearing scene, which I think is in the wire? Oh no, that that is quite funny though. But that's not one of the ones I mean. Okay, all right, that is that is the wire. Isn't yeah, the, the, they were they were given the network or someone gave yes, them yes. a limit that they could only use so many swear words per season, I think, or maybe it was maybe it was per episode. It, no, it was per episode. Yeah, it was per episode. It was per episode. So the two main guys, um, <laughs> uh, McNulty and what was McNulty's partner called? Uh, well, um, I don't remember. Bunk. Okay. But Mac- McNulty and Bunk, they decide to use all of the swears. Like their entire quota for the episode in one scene. I think I, when I heard that, I was like, "That's glorious, well yeah. done." It, it is. It is really funny. Now, it's not like you know, the, it's not like the well-written humor that I'm talking about in the other bits, but it is very funny. <laughs> and, I, and I suppose it's funny for like um, extraneous reasons. Yeah, like, yeah, it's got, it's got a funny like extra out of universe story behind it. Exactly, it's not in universe funny. Yeah, yeah. Hey, can I ask a quick question before we wrap up? Yeah. Um, can, can you find? <laughs> The Star Trek's there for me. How how far down are these guys? Next Generation is at 103. No! Just below Spartacus Gods of the Arena. Ah, here. That's oh. not. It should be higher than Spartacus Gods of the Arena for sure. Okay, let's let's play a game. Pick a TV show um, that you think might be in the top 250 and guess where you think it would be. Oh, oh my God. Okay. Um, I'll go with a really obvious one. I'll go with The Simpsons. The Simpsons. Oh, that's good. Okay. Um, the okay. Simpsons. Right. Now, I... Actually, to be honest, I'm a little bit surprised it's not in top 10, given its cultural importance. Um, 
Well, like, I, at this stage, uh, at least two-thirds of it is rubbish. Yeah, no, I know, I know, I know. What about... Maybe I would... Maybe around around 20, maybe? Nope. Nope, am I, am I too high? Yeah. Am I way too high? Not way too high. All right, around 30. Nope. <laughs> around 50? Nope. Too around... Low. Around 40. <laughs> 41. Simpsons. This, I mean, this is obviously going to change over time. Mm. But uh, uh, at the time of recording, it's at 41. Yeah. Okay, g- 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 name one for me to guess. I mean, oh, yeah, I have it in front of me, but I'll be honest. Oh, okay, right, cool. Um, What about Pokemon? Oh, that's a good one. I'm going to say... A, hmm... I've got kind of got two quite different ranges in mind. Let me think about it. Um, why have you got two ranges? I, I'm not sure why. It doesn't actually make any sense. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm going to say around 140. Say around 100. Ooh, you're rating very low. Okay. All right. Well, I don't, I don't like Pokemon, so. <laughs> all right. <laughs> it's not on the list. It's not on the list. It's not on the list. Now, okay, Pokemon has its problems, right? But surely that's enough of a cultural thing to get on the top 250. Like Doesn't make that, it good, though. No, but like, I mean, like, if it's been, if it's that ingrained in our culture, enough people must value it. Maybe just no Pokemon fans voted on this. I, I think, I think Pokemon's a little bit hard done by there. Is, uh, can I ask, and we should, we probably should wrap this up fairly soon, we've been going for ages. Can I ask, are, the, are any Pokemon-like things on it, like Digimon? Or say Yu Gi Oh. Digimon, no. Yu Gi. Uh, Yu Gi Oh's never gonna be on it. No. No. Okay. All right. Uh, I feel a little bit better about that then. There, there are some. There are some anime. Anything. Anything of note. Uh, Cowboy Bebop at twenty four. I watched a couple of episodes of that when we lived together, Bill. I need to finish that. That sounds. That's really, really good. I was very impressed with it. It's a, it's a very good show. Uh, Batman the Animated Series is immediately after it. Remember the one from the 90s? Yeah, that's also meant to be really good. That was that was amazing. Absolutely amazing TV. The Death Note anime is at 32. Right, um, okay. What else am I seeing here? Dragon Ball Z is at 44. Oh, I have and never... at 48 for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why that is. And I think I saw it somewhere else as well. Dragon Ball... <laughs> Control F. At, no, Dragon Ball is at 71. And at yeah. 76... And then there's a different one at two thousand and or at eighty six. Okay, <laughs> anyway, Dragon Ball is quite highly rated <laughs> <laughs> multiple times. Oh, okay. That, that I suppose that's not bad. Not bad anime. Avatar is at sixteen. Avatar: The Last Airbender is at sixteen. Oh, th- that's good. That's that's actually very high, and it deserves to be a high. It is amazing. Uh, what about what's the what's the first three episodes? Mm. Yeah, no, no, Bill. Not gone on this. Bill, 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 Bill. Now see. What you need to do there, Bill, is you have to acknowledge the fact that this this show is aimed at children, right? So, it, I th- for me anyways, it took them a little bit of time to realise that they really shouldn't pitch it to the kids. And they should pitch it to uh, older kids. Right. So, it, it, it's, it's not like Star Trek in that it takes you, like, ages to get into it. It might take you about maybe uh, six, seven, eight episodes. And mm, then you okay. start to get really to the meat of the really good, like, social commentary that they do in that thing. Uh, I'll tell about, you what I do like. What do you like? Uncle Iroh, so far. <laughs> Uncle Iroh's cool, isn't he? He's just he's just a chill old dude who likes drinking tea. But like, I can get behind that. He's a chill old dude, really nice old dude who likes drinking tea, who's a... See, I don't know that yet. Oh, I'll beep it out. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, no. Someone someone said that to me on Facebook as well. Um, okay, I, I think that adds a really interesting slant to his character because, like, internally, there's got to be some sort of like debate going on, raging between his past and his present, and mm. we're just not you're not given that quite. Oh, it's just Avatar is amazing. Okay, where do you think Legend of Korra is? I think Legend of Korra. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll cut this because this might be relatively controversial. Um, Legend of Korra, to my mind, should be higher than the original Avatar. Oh, wow. Because of the implications of what the series stands for. And what is that? Because what's called the main character is in a at least a bisexual relationship with another main character, and they're both female. If not, just, you know, they're in a lesbian relationship. And although it's not explicitly stated, 
you're smacked over the head with it. There's no way of missing it. And the creators have said that that's their intent. So I think it's beautiful that that's brought to like younger audiences. So for that alone, it's a significant milestone in like kids television and it should be higher than the original Avatar. Now, the problem is though, not everyone in the world are very is very enlightened. So I can imagine being that it's quite a controversial thing, it might mm. be very split and therefore drop a little bit. I'd like to see it above Avatar. I'd reckon it's below and I probably reckon it's below by a good bit. So do you want to put a figure on that? Avatar was what, 16? Yeah. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's like 30 or 40. 123. Oh, for God. You see, like, no, this is, this is, that is, that it really is a crime. Everything about the second Avatar is like Avatar, the original Avatar, but better. And I guarantee you it's that element that people, like, downvoted. That people just didn't, you know, get. Like, that, that I'm actually a little bit annoyed at that. I really am. Sorry. Like that, that, no, 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 I'm not annoyed at you. I'm annoyed at people. Like, that's, it is glorious. Have you seen it? Legend of Kara? Yeah. No, sure, I haven't seen Avatar. All right, okay. Do you know what? Skip Avatar. Forget it, right? Watch Legend of Korra if you get the chance. It's not, it's like, how how many seasons is it? Like three, three I think. Yeah, three. It's very short. Um, I think they're both three. It's, it, Legend of Korra is great and it will stand the test of time. Like 100%. It's it's, it's beautiful. But yeah, anyhow, sorry. I, I, I need to, uh, I need to go cool down because I'm very angry at that last point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall we, shall we wrap it up there? And I'm gonna go Let's wrap it up with that. Let's yeah. wrap it up with that. I'll go bang my head against a brick wall. Uh, <laughs> right, okay. Bill, it was a pleasure talking to you as always. Likewise, Edgar, as always. I will see you in a month's time. Certainly will. <laughs> all right, all the best, man. Edgar out. Edgar out. Out out of ten? Uh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> what? Like, I've told, like, I've just told you my feelings are complex. I can't just slap a simple numerical designation on it and be done. Uh, you don't have to slap a simple numerical designation. You could say pi. Okay. Well, no. I'm gonna say six i out of ten. <laughs> <laughs>